But I want to start with Shelley Fall um, because a lot of the conversation in the last year, of course, has been around child sexual abuse and the scandal involving the women's Olympic uh, gymnastics team especially and the, the team physician who was very highly regarded before just a couple years ago, Dr. Larry Nasser. Can you tell me what your organization is doing to uh, help prevent things like that from going on and the impetus for it? Sure, thanks, Mike. Yeah, the, the uh, U.S. Center for Safe Sport, uh, we really just opened our doors in March of this year, but the genesis of it really started within the U.S. Olympic Committee uh, several years ago, and um, through a lot of great uh, experts and working groups put together policies and uh, prevention strategies, trainings, et, et cetera. So at our core, we are about educating um, awareness and, and training on prevention, which is really the topic of, of this panel. Um, and all things from bullying, harassment, hazing, physical, emotional, and sexual misconduct in sport, all of the above, okay? Unfortunately, it sometimes takes a major um, headline uh, situation for uh, many of us to stand up and take notice, and I think that's probably the case. There have certainly been other um, high-profile cases, but <clears throat> the bottom line is that we are now, in addition to that uh, education awareness uh, and training, um, we are also uh, have the exclusive authority to investigate um, any reports, all reports of sexual misconduct for the Olympic and Paralympic movements. Uh, that is to say, all 47 national governing bodies uh, for the Olympic sports. We were talking before the session started, and you said that the impetus for that got going in about 2010. Did it even go further when the Jerry Sandusky Penn State scandal arose? Yeah, I, th I, mean, I definitely think that obviously the cumulative effect of, of, of some of these cases, I mean, there, there have been others as well, some more high profile than others. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that abuse in sport uh, from, if, whether it be physical, emotional, or sexual abuse in sport is, has been going on for a long time. And um, we, all of us, everyone in this room, everyone involved in youth sports uh, needs to be part of the solution. Um, unfortunately, I think, um, what happens, and we, we kind of call this the Sarah McLaughlin effect. Mm. Um, so if, you know, when you hear Sarah McLaughlin's voice and you see the, the abused and abandoned puppies on TV, you turn the channel. Anybody do that? <laughs> right, you turn the channel. Or you, or, you, or you stick on it and give money, shall right. we? No, yeah. I'm uh, well, <laughs> um, you know, we can't turn the channel. Like, we can't turn the channel. Mm. This is ugly stuff. It's heavy stuff all the more reason that we've got to stand up and, and be part of the solution. Um, your conviction is great. I want to, uh, before we move to the broader topic of the session, I want to ask, it, while you concentrate on the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic movements, if, if an organization, say anybody in this room, um, came to you in their own, if their own organization, whether it be a police athletic league <coughs> or, or a high school AU situation, do you, can you help with that legally? I mean, how, how do you get involved? Yeah, I mean, ultimate uh, bottom line is in terms of our awareness and education, we want to be for all people, for all organizations. So we want to partner with you. As it relates to the investigation or what we call our response and resolution, yeah. um, so investi investigatory side of things, we hope that uh, other uh, sport organizations will come to us and say, hey, um, we know you have a good and fair and expeditious process um, we'd like your help in, in looking at our reports, our investigations. Mm. So hopefully we will expand uh, beyond the Olympic and Paralympic movements, but that's our focus right now. I'm going to go to you, Nakia, first. Uh, Nakia Kemp with the Police Athletic League in Buffalo. You've, um, when we talked in the conference call before this thing worked, you, uh, you had all these unbelievable horror stories, including uh, people having the, turning their lights on their cars forever so kids could practice in the dark and, 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 and some really ugly hazing and bullying stories where children really go after children. H how are you addressing that? How are you addressing that and how are, how are you trying to prevent some of that in Buffalo? Well, the Police Athletic League of, of, of Buffalo, we service about uh, 20,000 children a year within the Western New York area with a concentrated focus on the city of Buffalo. Um, and just recently, I would say this 
past football season, we have implemented across the city new policies and procedures for little league coaches, uh, particularly in little league football. So the city is working together with other organizations to create the standard and saying in order to get a city permit to be able to play on the fields, you have to be able to go through particular training, you have to have a background check. So it became a citywide effort because we have so many children that play little league football. And part of that is um, when we talked about the story of coaches having children out there after school until nine and 10 o'clock at night and they would turn on their car lights. Um, crazy. <laughs> right. Um, so I think creating a safety standard for our children as far as coaches who we have working with them and them understanding the difference, um, really understanding the health of children and saying they, there needs to be some restrictions, some limits on school nights. It could only be till six o'clock. It could only be three nights a week versus five mm -hmm. nights a week. Um, and then the games are all day Saturday. So having a, a child out there, um, there's academic guidelines around that. You know, if a child has a certain grade level and they're falling below in school, then that has to be focused on first. So putting some guidelines that created a standard across the entire city um, for all of the football little league coaches to participate in. So I think that's how the city of Buffalo is really addressing that issue by creating a standard and policies and procedures around um, actually the usage of fields, starting from there and saying if you want to participate, if your league wants to participate, then you have to follow these rules in order to make sure that kids are safe. Well, being, um, having a six-year-old now, I, I got talked into doing some AAU coaching, and what I found is I don't know what I'm doing, and <laughs> I found that a lot of other people, and I, I, Dr. Satcher, from your point of view, like, is there something about untrained coaches, whether you could, you could recognize a concussion, whether you could recognize bullying, is, is that almost a form of abuse in itself when, you, when we don't have proper training? Yeah, we have a major concern about that. In fact, Coach Jack Crow, former coach at Arkansas, has put together a group of coaches to set standards for what all coaches should know about how to deal with concussions. It's a major concern about what happens to kids on the field. Because one of the most dangerous things is when a child has a concussion and then is sent back into the game, second concussions occurring over a short period of time can be a major problem. In fact, one of the major cases is Jake Snakenberg, who died in Denver because he was sent back into the game after suffering a concussion. His mother, in fact, was a part of our group. So yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, it's a major concern when concussions are not dealt with properly by coaches or maybe not even recognized by coaches. Shelly, one of the things we talked about also was the, I guess there were 30% of youth coaches, there was a survey that are properly trained, which kind of left it open, like 70%, almost 70% still don't have, um, they have background checks done, but they don't essentially have the skills to team build to ensure that some of the ugly bullying, some of the stuff that, uh, that you would watch for uh, doesn't happen. Um, what do you do about it? Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of what we're talking about is culture, right? You know, yeah. we're trying to create a culture that's positive, where kids want to play and uh, we're fun and, and, you know, that teamwork and team building and all the positive things of sports come out of it. And so I think having uh, coach and coach education programs where you're not only learning the uh, how, to, how to teach skills and age-appropriate um, abilities uh, and, and so forth, but you're learning um, the right policies and procedures about how to protect kids, whether it's physically mm -hmm. from, uh, in terms of contact sports and so forth, but also how do you keep them safe uh, from, um, uh, from bullying, from, from physical, emotional, and, and mental, uh, and, and sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, if it's, you know, coach, you know, we, like, we have, crazy coach syndrome, we have crazy parent syndrome, um, you know, and sometimes the coach is that, is, is that calming person in a, in a kid's life where um, there may be abuse at home, there may be um, abuse in that kid's life. So being able to recognize it uh, and be able to support that kid and learn where resources are to support them is equally important.
um, we, we can transition into this. What if you have the crazy coach and the crazy parent at the same time, Rick and Kale? And if you don't know, by the way, we talked about our resumes before. The Surgeon General, of course, has the best one. But Rick's, <laughs> I, think is, I think, is pretty impressive. He's the only player since Babe Ruth to actually pitch um, and hit 50 home runs in a season. Um, so I know you like hearing that, so I thought I'd bring it up. <laughs> you can tell him again if you want. Yeah, all right, I will. Uh, but, but no, I think that he, he has a great message because in his book, he's very candid about his relationship with his father and, and how his father was abusive in many ways, and you probably didn't even realize it at the time. No, you know, and, and um, I grew up in a dysfunctional home, <clears throat> and my father was my coach, and, and being in that father, so I did deal with both. So the, the thing was, he was so overbearing and overwhelming, um, and baseball really became the place that saved me. I was just naturally good at it, but when you're constantly being beat down by somebody who's verbally abusive to you, well, I couldn't find confidence. I never really felt accepted. I didn't trust people, and baseball was that place for me. That's where I went, where I felt like this is my safe haven. Um, and there were times when he was my coach, and times as he wasn't, so I felt like baseball kind of saved me. Um, and that's, that's a hard thing to deal with. Now, hearing Shelly talk about the programs that they're doing, if I, maybe if I would have had a place to go to say, hey, I'm dealing with this. And my father was also abusive to my mother. And, and um, so it was just a bad home life. But I was so afraid. I grew up in a small town in South Florida. I was just so afraid if I went and told anybody that it was going to get back to him and it was going to make it worse for me and my mother and everybody else involved. And I really felt like I had nowhere to go. I wish that, um, you know, I'm glad that we're making the movement that we are and you guys are making the push that you are. And, you know, it could have really made a difference in my, my younger life, for sure. Could, could you, I'm just playing devil's advocate for yep. a minute, could you have really gone to someone when your dad is, I mean, you're, that's your household right yep. there. You're almost, it's so, uh, I don't know who I'd go to. Yeah, no, I would, were, yeah, I didn't mean to cut you No, up. go yeah, ahead. I was afraid, no question. I was young, I was scared, um, especially in that, when I talk about like that six to 10 to even 11 to 12, I would have probably been so scared to go talk to somebody else. But I remember an instance when I was 13 and he was my coach and we got into it over something and it became this yelling match, basically him cussing me out on the field in front of the parents, in front of my teammates and basically kicked me off the field. And I was so embarrassed and humiliated. Um, you know, I walked, luckily I had a friend that lived about a mile away and I walked, walked to his house and left. Um, that was it, and then I said I would never play for him again. Um, but, that, but at that time, I was getting to the point where I was old enough now where I was going to start standing up for myself. Um, and I think at that age, at 13 at least, and 14, 15, moving into that, um, I was starting to develop the courage that I would have went and talked to somebody if I felt like I had a safe place to go. For any of our panelists who want to weigh in on this one, I, uh, I'm sure people in this room, um, we always hear about PC cultures ruining America's toughness. We always hear about... Um, the lines that are crossed and the lines that aren't crossed. How far do you go? I, I, could, I could name a few coaches in my life, I'm sure you could too, that, that pushed you almost to what you consider either verbal abuse or physical abuse, but they made you better. H how do you watch for that line? Any of you the way in on that? Because, because I think that there's something to be said for someone who kicks you in the ass, so to speak, in life, and you need that, and then... And then how do, you, how do you recognize, well, that's gone too far? How do you really, how do you really find that in someone? I'll go. I feel like... Um, you just talk. No, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, no, I mean, it is kind of a slippery slope there. Um, and for me, you know, I thrived in a positive in environment and positive reinforcement, and that was something my father could never recognize. Everything was negative, you little, you know, fat this or whatever. I was chubbier when I was little, and... Um, he just couldn't understand it. I mean, it, I, you know, there were times if I swung at a high pitch, he'd maybe come home and run laps. Um, and I didn't need that. I was already gravitating towards baseball. I was motivated by it. I was something that I was good at. Um, and you're right, I, I do think it is a slippery slope. To me, it almost seems like, you know, every kid is different. We talked about this on the panel. And what, who needs positive reinforcement and who needs a little bit of, you know, tough love, so to speak. Um, you know, for me, I, I think it's when they become too personal mm. in, in a personal way, then, then to me that starts to become abuse. I think um, we work with a lot of our, our coaches and, and support staff to really do a lot of professional development around youth development and understanding the different levels of the way you would talk to a six-year-old versus the way you would talk to a 12-year-old. I think the more you educate people um, on recognizing those cues, mm. then there may be a child that can take what you're giving to them and be a better 
athlete, but then you may have one that it may withdraw them more. And being able to recognize those cues and be given those tools in order to make those decisions, I think is the best route because every child is different. Every child's home life is different. Uh, we service a lot of children that are in foster care or who have, or who have parents who are incarcerated. Um, so a lot of them need a different sort of environment and being able to cultivate your staff and your coaches to recognize that I think is a key point. Yeah, yeah, and you know, let's face it, as a coach, you know, you're shaping a human being, yes. not just an athlete. Mm -hmm. And I think the best coaches understand that, that they're, that they're responsible and, and, and as in part, um, along with parents, hopefully. Mm -hmm. uh, as you said, sometimes there are no parents. Uh, sometimes they become the de facto parent. But regardless, um, you know, you're, you're shaping that human being and building their character uh, for life. And... Um, so it's a huge responsibility. And so, and I think that that's all the more reason our coach uh, education programs need to be so strong and that we need to make sure that folks like yourself that find yourself in a you know, volunteering to uh, take on a coaching position, um, you know, in a, in a local situation, that you have the resources available for, for uh, you as well. Well, I had a coach in high school who was also my chemistry teacher. And he decided uh, that I was going to do well in chemistry and in maybe even going into medicine. And so uh, he wouldn't let me make the team. I didn't know this until I spoke at his memorial. And his son said, I'm surprised you didn't tell the story about Pappy putting you off the football team because you were his best chemistry student. I didn't know it. So, but it's interesting. So. Coaches um, care about students in a lot of cases. They, there are a lot of ways to show that caring. So I think, I think they deserve a lot of credit because this was a coach who, during a period of segregation in this country, where we rode the bus 20 miles to a, a black school and couldn't go to the school one mile away from us because it was segregated. Pappy Don wanted some of his students to go on and do well in chemistry and maybe even go to medical school. If it had not been for that, I never would have been Surgeon General, I can guarantee you that. Was he alive when you became Surgeon General? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. He was what was that proud. conversation like? Mm -hmm. Oh, he was always having me back to Anniston to tell the story about <laughs> how I got to be Surgeon yeah. General. So, but, and did you, in your heart, keep a little bit of animosity that he wouldn't let you play for him anymore? Well, um, you didn't know that, right? I didn't know it yeah. until later. Oh, that's yeah. right. You did right. But I was <laughs> now always now. Do you have it? I was always an athlete at heart. You know, I was the mm. first Surgeon General to complete the Marine Corps Marathon at age 61, by the way. Oh, okay. So this commitment to sports. Yeah. Thank you. Take that, Rick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll walk it off. Yeah, we talked about children getting on children, um, and I thought one of the great things about that was the notion that a, a parent should always be present because you, you get less bullying, but at some point you're going to have that. How do you deal with that at a local level, especially in Buffalo? Well, I, I think going back to education and really educating not just uh, the coaches and the parents, but also peer-to-peer. Um, working with a lot of the students within the school district so that they understand. Um, we've started a, a, a method in most of the, the public schools in Buffalo, really focusing on peace circles and talking and uh, for children to have some other outlets uh, to have more conversations around bullying curriculum, around how to make others feel, getting more in touch with their feelings. Because um, it's very important for the adults to recognize when that's going on, but it's also important for the youth to understand when it's happening to them and what to do and how to react and how to respond and who to go to, giving them those tools in order to have peer-to-peer. -peer. So looking at different curriculum so that they have the tools that they need in order to recognize it themselves. On the, on the uh, conference call, you use the word restorative, restorative justice. which I love mm -hmm. that. Restorative justice. Talk, talk about that. Well, restorative justice is, is an initiative um, where really you're looking at um, youth, again, having that conversation with youth 
and being able to present their feelings. So for example, we work a lot with uh, community schools programming in Buffalo. Uh, so we're, we work within 13 schools offering sports sampling clinics on the weekends. So Saturday mornings, kids can come in and learn a different sport, lacrosse, basketball, baseball. Um, we actually ran a little uh, basketball sports clinic and in the middle of the clinic, we have a bunch of children, different ages, all playing together that didn't know each other. Um, we sat them down and said, okay, now we're gonna sit in a peace circle and we're gonna talk about how you feel about what's going on in your lives. And they were just caught off guard, like what? <laughs> what are we doing <laughs> playing basketball? But it was a nice pairing where children had a, had a chance to really have some conversation about what was going on and then continue to develop that teamwork because now they know the person that they're playing with. They know what they're battling with and they know how to support them. So being able to, to build that foundation um, from youth from the, that young age up really helps with the prevention of, of bullying. All right, Q&A, we're gonna start a Q&A here real quick for you. Are you a father now? Yes. Does it change how you look at your own children growing up and how you're gonna, how you're gonna coach them and, uh, and provide all the things that they need going forward? Yeah, 100%. My kids are five and six, two, I have two boys, um, and, I, and I feel like it's my job from what I went through is to break that cycle and to give them positive reinforcement and let them thrive and try to understand. And I understand they're both different and my, each one might you know, re respond to a different thing and it's my job to figure that out and give them everything they need, need to be successful in what they do. Right. We have a brief question and answer session, about five, 10 minutes. Um, yes, excellent. So for the first question, we're going to go with what's highlighted on the screen. That is, how do we balance the need for coach education and training with the fact that they are volunteers and too many requirements might discourage them from stepping up? It's a good question. Go uh, we uh, at the Police Athletic League work a lot with police and police are volunteers within a lot of our programs. And what we really try to do is have the conversation with volunteers knowing that we, we recognize and appreciate their time and effort that they're giving up in their free time to work with the youth in the community, but also giving them those tools. And we find oftentimes that volunteers want to be the best volunteers that they can be. They don't want to just be thrown into a situation and say, just mm. because you want to be a soccer mom, go ahead and mm. do it. They want the tools and they want to be uh, given those tools and have resources for them to utilize in that way. But we also celebrate our volunteers and saying we're giving you all these tools because we want the kids to be safe. We emphasize safety. We emphasize healthy. We emphasize um, you're going to, you know, this is going to make your life a lot easier if you have have the tools to deal with a child if you're you're frustrated or if you have an unruly child this is gonna these tools are gonna be easy for you to do your job as a volunteer and then we celebrate them we do a lot around um, celebrating them giving them certificates the children give them awards um, so we really want to um, celebrate our volunteers and know that you know, and I do, I share the scary stories with them. If mm. you do not have this training, this could happen. You could have something scary happen. You could have a child accuse you of, of something or anything could happen. You don't want to leave yourself. You want to be able to come in and have an enjoyable experience and feel self-fulfilled when you leave at the end of the day. So we want to do what, what's best. Yeah, I think there's something to be said for uh, untrained coaches mm -hmm. can lead to abuse. I mean, it's a form of mm -hmm. abuse in its own way. Um, really quickly on that one. Shelly, um, when I attended a, a session from the children, Missing and Exploited Children Society on how to, uh, how to uh, search for pedophiles in your midst, it was a very disturbing uh, session led by John Walsh, the America's Most Wanted star, and, um, and, and several athletes who were sexually abused as a child. Um, and so, uh, and Cal Ripken helped put it on. It was a great, uh, it, it was a great session, but it was also really disturbing because you find out that many of the people grooming kids for this uh, have better networks than the actual people preventing it. I guess I'd ask you, you know, are you partnering with them? And is Safe Sport what is Safe Sport doing to maybe get a gold standard out there for you have to pass this test to make sure that you see when there's a pedophile in your midst. Yeah, you know, we're, we're partnering with anybody and everyone, um, you know, from sports, but as well as from the abuse space. 
including the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Um, it, but you think about it this way. Where do you think the pedophiles are going to gravitate to? Right? They're going to go to the path of least resistance. So the fewer hurdles they have to overcome in terms of training, in terms of background checks, et cetera, that's where they're going to show up. So um, if we put children first, if we look at their safety, their well-being first, mm. then our job is certainly to make the trainings accessible and, um, and, and effective um, so that we can protect kids. Uh, but we've got to have those safeguards in place. Another question? Yes, so on that note, um, what is the next evolution of background checks to ensure abusive coaches in the previous environments um, but are not persecuted, uh, prosecuted, sorry, do not enter your coaching system? I think this is a great question only because um, Larry Nasser, the U.S. Olympic team physician that was recently indicted by the FBI, was after a report to Michigan State was allowed to continue coaching and there were only certain um, restrictions given to him that he essentially you know you couldn't touch a woman this way or it, while you're examining her it was it, it, to me there's like there's one in that business there's one strike and you're out and so I wonder you know, Dr. Satcher anything any thoughts on that? Well I really think that it's really critical that we, we protect our children. I, I believe that it's important for children to be physically active. I think it's a major plus for them to be involved in team sports. But then it becomes our responsibility to create what we at the National Council of Youth Sports Safety call a culture of prevention. Now, whether that's preventing sexual abuse or preventing kids from uh, getting concussions that can really end their career, their lives, what have you, I think we've got to be committed to a culture of prevention. And I think each of these areas, uh, sexual abuse, uh, concussions, and going back into the game, all of those have got to become major targets of our efforts in the near future. Uh, time for one or two more, gang. Um, the next question will be that many organizations choose to pay for a background check instead of coach education. Do you feel that background checks are more important than training coaches? It's, I'll jump in on that. Yeah, one. Like, it's it. not either or. It's not either or. Like, you no. got to have both, right? You got to have, you both. Gotta have both. And by the way, you know, there's $3 background checks and there's $20 background checks. Mm -hmm. Quite frankly, we need we need the better background checks. We need to we need to work together to to make them affordable for everyone. Um, and, and, but that doesn't, um, but, but remember, only the people that have been convicted of something are gonna show up in most background checks. Mm -hmm. um, so keep that in mind. Um, I th still think that there are, are other ways to um, look at a person's history. Mm -hmm. For you to know too, from the US Center for Safe Sport, again, our, our uh, our our um, jurisdiction starts and ends with the Olympic and Paralympic movement. So um, all, including youth um, grassroots organizations that are um, part of the national, the 47 national governing bodies. Um, but anyone that we sanction, that we um, make a sanction against, have a finding and, and create a sanction, uh, will be listed in a searchable database on our website. Already are uh, at safesport.org. So anybody. Anybody, a parent at a youth hockey program or youth soccer, whatever, can go to our website to see if um, their child's coach has had a sanction from, uh, as it relates to the Olympic or Paralympic movements. Outside of that, we don't have a jurisdiction. We don't have those databases. Um, so being able to work with other youth sport organizations is going to be really important and, and looking at uh, their backgrounds. Well, pardon my ignorance on this, but there's, you just said 47 national governing bodies. Are they right. talking to each other? I, I just want to yeah. 
jump in. Yeah, yeah, go. <laughs> um, in, in the city, in the city of Buffalo, but in the state of New York as a whole, there are many systems. You have your, you know, your New York State Education Department, and then you have your Office of Family and Children's Services, and then you have your criminal federal background checks. You have your state background checks. Mm. But what's really important in, in to note in this is that you have to have a a system that are they're all talking to each other. You have to have a collaborative system, and a lot of times that begins with um, advocacy at the government level and changing laws within your state. In the, in the city of Buffalo, we actually get the funding through the city of Buffalo to actually do the background uh, checks for a lot of the youth coaches that play on city fields. So that's funding that comes directly from, from the city, but also on a state level, the Office of Children and Family Services has um, across the entire state for licensed programs for people to do the background checks through there. And then there's the central clearance registry, which is another <laughs> background check. Um, so it really depends on uh, your system in your state and how you're collaborating across the board. And a lot of it is looking at policies around governing bodies to make sure that everyone is talking to each other and to make sure that you're collectively using those resources, because why pay $59 for this one, $69 for that one, and you're getting different so everyone needs to work together to make sure that there's a collaborative effort so that you're saving this your your city or your state money as opposed to doing this, doing that. But I totally, going back to the question, believe that um, you can't have one without the other. I mean, it just, it, it just doesn't make any sense not to have um, adequate uh, professional development and background checks at the same time. And sorry, Mike, really quickly, the 47 NGBs, any sanction we hand out, whether it's a suspension or a lifetime ban, has to be upheld across the Olympic oh. movement. So all, it's, it's across. So you, there's no jumping from sport to sport. Now, could someone go outside of the uh, Olympic or Paralympic uh, sports and possibly get a job? Yeah. Mm -hmm. all right. It could. Keeps me awake at night. 